the hour is far spent. It's customary. Some of our traditions, when you stand to speak, you ask for permission from the elders. If it's okay, you, you say something. But Colette, I know how long this has been for you. I ask for your permission to speak. We are celebrating the life, the legacy, and the gift of A. Donald McEachin. In these past few years, I grew very, very close to Don. In his political career, and we would have encounters, and we would have moments where we'd be in a setting, we would talk about his faith. And then we talked about coming to seminary. And he made a decision to do that, and he first knew me as his professor and his dean. And for the past seven years or so, he has called me pastor. And I am honored to be able to stand here this day and affirm the sermon that he's already preached with his life. You've heard all of these comments and there's nothing that I can add. I would like to tell Pastor, thank you again, but you'll notice I do have on red. <laughs> There is, sometimes as preachers, you can get into performance. But when you're a pastor, you gotta practice the presence. And my joy is being with a handful of folk in Hanover County, in a place that was called Negro Foot. Tradition would have it because of that fork on the road of Copesville and Scottstown Road. They now say it's Beaver Dam, but when I went there and started that life, it was Negro Foot. Because in that space, tradition had it that persons kissed by the equatorial sun of Africa who were enslaved and sought their freedom and went toward freedom fled and for their punishment their appendages were cut off and those appendages were hung in the trees to intimidate anybody who wanted to pursue freedom donald would make his way from the south side to hanover because we grew in relationship he was a critical thinker and uh, i gave him space to be a heretic I gave him room to raise those hard theological questions and I would raise them with me. Time didn't permit any analysis of some of those hard theological questions, but Pastor and I were just reminiscing and talking out there in, 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 in the vestibule. The greatest threat to knowing God is to know God so well already. You're not open to the mystery of God and the future of God. God will always stretch you beyond the limits of your consciousness and understanding so that you have to consistently meet God afresh. And we would do that together. And I don't apologize for this is hard for me. Because this was my friend. And I can feel the loss that all of us feel of this unique presence. I want to thank God for all politicians have stood. Can I ask the ministers to stand? Thank you. Because you gotta understand that Don was in politics as a calling, 
that was from God and not just the machinations of human design and construct. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. I do want to acknowledge some of the folk that came down from, from Beaver Dam. I want his colleagues in ministry, his partners who sat with him in ordination. Come on, stand up just a minute, please, y'all. These are just his partners in ministry. Those are some of the pastors. His, his, past, his pastor team and the members of Ebenezer will see you, thank you. But let me just take a few moments. A few years ago when Don was um, entering into the Congress, I, I preached a sermon during the Lenten season. And it was entitled, Enough of This. And it was taken from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the 51st verse, where there's a moment in the life of Jesus where they came to arrest him and persecute him and lead him to the route that would end at Golgotha. They came to him, and when they came, one of his disciples, and Luke, it doesn't name it, in the 18th chapter of John, it tells you it was Peter, and the person's ear he cut off was Mark. Mark was the servant of the high priest. He went, and one of the disciples cut his ear off, and the words from the mouth of Jesus were, enough of this. He reached and touched placed the ear and healed the wound. Then he turned to those who had come and he says, what kind of people are you? I sat with you daily in the temple and you acted like I was your friend. And now you come at me like I'm a criminal. But that's okay. It's all right, because this is your season. This is the hour of darkness. Allow me to just say, oh, Donald, enough of this. Listen for the person, the principles, the purpose and the promise. I pray God's precious word. That God's spirit will now speak. And the words of a mortal man would reveal the testimony of eternity. Enough of this, the person. To understand the person, you can't begin where I began. Because the text in the Good News Bible, today's English version, begins, but Jesus said, enough of this. You miss it in the King James because it says, suffer ye thus far. In the New Revised Version, it says no more of this. But enough of this. But to understand the person, that word but there is contravenance of a present reality or condition. I contravene that reality with an alternative expression, behavior, and action in times like these. But you've got to go back to the beginning to understand where this comes from because the whole, that 22nd chapter begins with this. And Jesus had been teaching, healing, and moving. And in that moment, there were those who were plotting to do him harm. But they couldn't do it because the people affirmed him. Don McKeachin, like this person who speaks in the text, was a divergent personality. And institutions and systems don't like divergent personalities. 
Systems are always constructed. And once they are constructed, there are always elements within the system who receive benefit, privilege, promotion, power, and possession through the operation of the system. But once you benefit from a system, you don't want any personality that would alter that system because truth is not truth that transforms the system. The truth is anything that maintains my privilege, my position, my power, and my possessions. So I can't celebrate, really celebrate it, even though I might even mourn when they die. The reality is that their existence is a threat to the perpetuation of my design and my desire. And this, in this case, in the case of Jesus, the religious leaders and the political leaders wanted to destroy him. Because he dared to say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, I'm not going to preach what y'all been preaching. I'm not going to affirm the policies you've been affirming. The Spirit is upon me to bring some good news to those who don't have good news, to those who are poor. I want some folk who have had their eyes put out see again. I want some captives set free. I want some wounds bound up. I want to preach a word that talks about the promise of God and not the continuation of this present reality. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That was person. And then in the midst of it, that person said, I want to, let's have church, y'all. Let's have a moment of faithful remembrance of our history and our story. Let's celebrate the feast of the unleavened bread. Let us celebrate the Passover. And at the table, that person showed you a model of strength and power. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. He provided a model that was not, was not defined by a power position, a privilege, a promotion. It was defined by the capacity to be so strong in who you are, you can release yourself in service to bless somebody else. He provides an epitome of manifestation of the character of God because true strength never needs a victim. When you are strong, you don't need somebody else to be in the condition of negation in order for you to receive your affirmation. You don't need somebody to be beneath you. You don't need somebody to be other. All you need to say is, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And whatever has been deposited in me. I commit myself to release it, to bless somebody else, and to make this world a better place. And when I sit where I sit, and I see people wounded, hurt, and denied, I will never use where I sit for personal privilege and promotion. I will stand on what I'm called to do. He said, this is my body, but you stop and look, family. As soon as the people who sat at the table left, they start arguing about who's the greatest. That those who even claim intimacy with the Savior, even though they said they were of the faith, their consciousness, their psychology, their behavior was dictated and defined by the categories of the world and not a relationship with the Savior. So the minute they left church, they played the world's game. Who's the greatest? Who's number one? And if you read it closely and read the original language, it was not just a discussion. It was an out-and-out fight. Because our goal is to promote ourselves. Our goal is to privilege ourselves and you just sat with Jesus. And then Jesus gave them a great lesson. He said, listen y'all, you say you follow me, but the way you're talking, you're talking like the world because in the world, that's how you do what you do. But if you want to be great, serve. If you really want to know what greatness is, serve. And then he said this, and if you know how to serve, you will sit with me at my table. Hmm? 
Ironically, when your conscience is messed up, you even view the privilege of sitting with Jesus as another one of your promotions and privileges because you get to go up and other folk get to go down. Stay with me. So you don't even know how to envision a reality where there is no up and down. There's just a relationship and that you're sitting at the table is not an alteration in your condition in the hierarchy. It's the collapse of the hierarchy where we no longer live by that. We just sit around the table and embody what God designs for all creation. If you can understand this. And then he went out and did what he would always do. He prayed. He said, God, this gets heavy sometimes. God, I wish I didn't have to endure what I have to endure. And God, could we consider some alternative ways and outcomes of the consequence of total service? But God, I said yes to do you. And even when I sit in comfort, not my will, but your will. That's the person, y'all. Do you see the person? And then the moment after that comes the moment where his enemies would come after him. And the response of those around him is, get him! Whew. But the person was so principled. He did not allow context and the behaviors of others to dictate the character of his own existence or his behavior. That is when others would want to cut, destroy, demean, negate. He was the one that said, enough of this. Not only now we text, <laughs> we would text you know, every week and we'd have a discussion, sometimes about nothing, sometimes just say, I'm praying for you. And he would sometimes text and say, you pray for me. I got this this week, I pray for that. But his principles were so deep that he demonstrated the character of a truly principled person. And that was, he always never presumed that he was right. Let me, let, me, let me push this. Not that I'm not right about what I'm pushing, but I never want to get so secure in my location and my interpretation that I can't go before God and say, Lord, have mercy. Teach me more, Lord. One of the great distortions in the Christian tradition is people who come to the faith all of a sudden become self-presumptive and arrogant and believe that they're holy while everybody else is a sinner and messed up. And they begin to believe it's my job in my perceived holiness to fix everybody else because I'm the only one that's right and I can show y'all how to get right. And not only can I show you, I will show you how everybody else in this country ought to think like me, act like me. I'll even have conferences with the people who sit in the high court to tell them how to resolve. Oh, never mind, that's another issue. I want to make everybody pure like me. But that is one of the great fallacies of intimacy with God. Because the closer you get to God, you don't become super holy. You become confessional and aware that God is bigger than you and you don't know it all. And God is not through with you yet. When you have that neophyte fever where you reduce everything to a set of legalism and you got a doctrine that everybody conforms to, it's not a sign of maturity, it's a sign of immaturity because you reduce God to concepts, doctrines, and boxes and you can't see how God is bigger than what you even think you know about God. So every time he would talk, he would be confessional. He would say, he would say, Pastor, what do you think about that? Huh? He would tell me, Pastor, I, I almost lost it. Uh, well, he tells me, me and God fussed this morning. And I don't have time to get into what a blessing it is when your faith is strong enough to fuss with God. We fussed and we would talk about that. Can I say this, Paula? He loved you. He loved you so much. Children, can I tell you? 
Oh my God, he loved you. Because I'm going to be honest with you, he talked about you all. <laughs> and he let me in on all the secrets. We can trust each other. And he, we vented sometime. Amen. And not only did he talk to me about y'all, I was able to talk to him about my family. But guess what the prayer always was? Could I have loved her better? Pastor, did I love my best? He talked about the children growing up. Was I the best daddy I could be? And one of the things I always share with him, you never get relationships perfect. Because relationships are dynamic. And you're growing into a relationship. You're learning into a relationship. The reality is, that's why I enjoy this stage in my life, just seeking God and not becoming an expert in God. Do you know that, 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 it, that, that it's in front of me? He was still learning. Pastor, how do I talk to this about this? How do I, how do I love? And then guess what, one of the things about that? How do I say I'm sorry? Amen. How do I say I didn't quite get that one right? And the arrogance of presumption always leads you with a list of checks off. And you say, I did this, I did this, I did that, I did that. His prayer was always, God, teach me. Help me be better. You see, when you first meet God, it's like looking into those lights. And the light that illuminates your being also blinds you. Because it's so powerful, it's a moment where you can't see anything other than what? When I light it, I see the things immediately around me. So I think I'm holy because I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't go here and I don't do that. But once you begin to walk into the light and you don't look at the light, you look with the light, you begin to recognize the dimensions of your being that are out of harmony with the intent, desire, design of God. And you don't say, God, bless them sinners over there. You say, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, I see differently. I see and I pray, God, that you would help me grow. He was principled and so principled. Notice, okay, I got to move quick. Look, he was so principled that he did not let context or crew dictate his behavior. In that context, it was appropriate to pull out the sword. Even earlier, he even said, if you got a sword, and we said, we got two, he said, that's enough. But I, want to, I think the real lesson there is you may have a sword, but you got to know when to use it. Now look, look, look. He gets that in principle. You know, his, his best buddies, in this case, you know, his, his right man is, you know, is the one who pulls out and cuts him. And you, sometimes you gotta say to friend and foe. You can't just follow your party. You can't just follow the crew you run with. You can't just follow the one you run with. Because when the when the when his crew pulled out a knife, he said enough of this. Enough of this. That's not who I am, and that's not how I want. And if you're going to roll with me, you need to alter your behavior under these present circumstances and conditions. And here's our mantra that we would recite. You can never allow what's coming at you to dictate what comes from you. Because if what's coming at you determines what comes from you, then what's coming at you is now in you. And you are no different than that which is coming at you. But when you know who you are in God, you can't live by what's coming at you. you got to live by the power that is in you. And greater is he that is in you than there is any power in the world. Now you can come at me, but you don't dictate how I come to you. Because his purpose was this, and we'll, we'll end his, uh, you know, all preachers end three times, so that's the first one. <laughs> Look what he did. My purpose is healing. See, you cannot invest in policies, procedures, and behavior that contradicts what you pronounce as your vision. Come on. Don't tell me that there's no room for hate, and then you write hateful policy. Don't tell me 
you are for everybody and then you won't tell the truth about the history that killed somebody. And the whole time you were practicing deceit to do harm to the vision. He said, but that's all right. Because this is your season. This is the hour of darkness. See, some people read that and start bemoaning. Yeah, it's dark. What you don't need, you need to shout. Because what, what Jesus did, did was just establish a limit and the parameters of darkness. You don't have 24. You don't have a day. You don't have a week. You don't have a month. You don't have a year. You don't have an eternity. You got an hour. You're in the middle of the hour of darkness. But the minute I said this is your hour, I was telling everybody else, you ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come because you're going to have some hours like this. You're going to have some times like this. But this is their hour. You keep walking in my future. You keep believing in my future. One of the last conversations we had was talking about denying how people will deny everything. You deny the integrity of elections. You deny an environmental crisis. You even deny the potential uh, impact of a global pandemic. You deny the brutality inflicted upon people and the history that is still resident and institutionalized and systematized in some aspects of the way we do business in this country. You deny patriarchal patriarchy and misogyny that doesn't even want a woman to be in control of her own being. You deny your homophobia. You deny your xenophobia. You deny, but I got news for you. Donald was a believer. He believed in God. He believed in the promise of this nation. And he didn't want us to go back to an illusion. He wanted us to live into a future that had never been, that we might achieve what God desires for the global community. He believed in the intrinsic worth and dignity of every human being. He believed in the sanctity of creation and the gift of this garden called earth. And he believed in you and me. And I'm so glad that he was not a denier. He was a believer. And because he was a believer, he said, enough of this. Enough of this. I believe God is not through with us yet. I believe there's a future I has not seen. It has not heard. It has an enemy to your imagination. God's got more. God's still invested. Enough 
are this, and here's what I believe. I believe if enough of us will say enough of this, justice will flow like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. I believe if enough of us would say enough of this, we could heal a broken world and a violent community. He always was upset as to how we'll get together and decry violence in the streets, but not even acknowledge the violence that's in the tweets emanating from the White House and the legislature. Oh, you know, you didn't hear me. That you have built your system on violence and you get mad when this happens in the street. When are you going to clean up the violence in your own house? The reality is, if enough of us would say enough of this, I believe that we can partner with God to help America fulfill her promise. I believe, I believe he was a patriot because he did not glorify the failure. He stood on the promise. And I further believe that on the the second Tuesday this year of November, the people said, you got the victory. But I also believe on the fourth Monday of November, God said, they chose you for Congress. But tonight, I choose you for eternity. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. And it's time for you to say, enough of this. Come on with me. Where the wicked will cease from troubling. The weary will be at rest. And justice will flow. I don't know about you, but I believe. And because I believe, I simply say, enough of this. Come on, can somebody praise God for the word of God? Hallelujah. 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 Come on out, tell us, lift it up, all three. 